News Radio 700 WLW. Marriage expert. We've had her on many times, and it's great to welcome back Jennifer Hargrave. Jennifer, how are you on this glorious Saturday? I am great, Ken. Really happy to be talking to you about premarital agreements. <laughs> I, you know, I'm happy to be talking about this with you as well. I wish I had talked about this with you, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But right now, <laughs> I'm happy to be talking to you about this. Now, let's talk about these things. How, you know, yeah. I, I know celebrities do this and sports stars do this when there's a lot of money millions, tens of millions of dollars, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars that each party may have accumulated before the marriage, well, then they sign prenups, so they're not completely taken to the cleaners when and if the marriage breaks up. But for just the general, you know, a guy on the street like me, woman on the street like you, I mean, are prenups a good thing to have in principle before a marriage? You know, in a lot of cases, they are. So let's First, talk about what happens if you don't have a prenup, right? So whatever state you're living in at the time of either the death or the divorce, because your marriage is going to end one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the, the laws of that state are going to govern how property is disposed, how, how it gets divided among your heirs and between the parties if it's in the case of a divorce. So... Um, so, so there's this default out there. Now, a lot of people have no idea. They've never even thought about what happens when our marriage ends to all of my property. How can I make sure my loved ones are protected? Mm -hmm. Because they are just thoroughly in love with the other person, right, and blinded by love. So sure. a prenup, is, it is a good, if you are getting married, it is a good thing to start asking questions about because you can actually custom tailor what you want to have happen in the event of death or divorce. And, and so for a lot of couples, especially if this is a second marriage and they have children that they want to make sure that, that an inheritance is set aside for them, or, um, you know, if you have your, this is the first marriage, but, you know, you've acquired a lot of property, it's a really good idea to begin to think, do the laws, you know, work for me, or do I want something, you know, custom tailored to our unique situation. Sure, sure. but there are, there are those who think, Jennifer, that when you sign a prenup or you enter into something like that, you're almost saying this marriage is going to fail, so I better be careful about what happens. And so there's a, a little bit of negativity going into something like that. Do you buy into that at all? Um, I certainly see that as the norm, and I think a lot of um, the family law attorneys, divorce attorneys also view prenups the same way. I take a different approach because I think it's really a great time for a couple to get really educated about how they're going to own property. I think, you know, those of us who, who just get married um, and have never had a discussion about what any of this means are kind of blindsided when we find out, holy smokes, all that money I've been earning and setting aside in my retirement, I now have to split with this person. Like, they have no idea. So I do think um, we can approach it in a really constructive way where we're empowering both people to know and understand how they're going to own property. Please don't take this the wrong way, because, but it is gender specific. I, I know so many guys right now that have had holy smokes moments. <laughs> I just yeah. you said that. <laughs> Oh my goodness! That's exactly right, and it works both ways. I mean, I'll tell you, I got a, I got a lot of women clients who have been the primary breadwinner too, and they are shocked to learn that they have yeah. to give that cheating, you know, by yeah. a, yeah. a, a big payout. So, what, yeah. a, what, what's the most bizarre prenup that you've ever written up, or that you've, or, or that you've <laughs> seen in your various times in a courtroom? Yeah. So um, most of the time, prenups are really about property and taxes and, you know, payouts and who gets the house and all of that kind of stuff, right? But people come in to uh, request a prenup with all kinds of crazy ideas about, you know, contracts about how often they're going to have sex, who they're going to have sex with, you know, crazy things like that. And I... I, you know, just in my practice, I would say, look, if you have to have it written in a contract that your spouse is going to be responsible for so many loads of laundry and so many loads of dishes and, you know, how many times you're going to mow the lawn and how many times you're going to have sex, is marriage really the right, mm. you know, uh, relationship structure for you? <laughs> because one of the big things has to do with enforceability. Like, the whole reason why we have a prenup is that so the couple will know it's enforceable when, when that event happens. And a lot of these provisions, I promise you, our courts are not going to 
went to see your calendar for how many times you had sex and whether that was, um, you know, <laughs> what you what you contracted right. for. Right, right. So. Well, since, since you brought up sex, and you always bring up sex every time I talk to you, Jennifer, so... <laughs> I want to ask you about this because I see this story. I think it's a it's a couple in London, and the boyfriend refused refused to marry her unless she agreed to have sex with him at least twice a week. Now that seems a little low, particularly for newlyweds. But who knows? I don't know. Maybe that's the way it works for them. But my fact, my point is, is if you've got to put that into a contract, chances are you don't know the person that you're marrying in the first place, right? I couldn't agree with you more, Ken. I mean, look, the one thing, the one way you're going to sabotage your sex life is to, is to make it a contractual obligation, right? That just takes all the fun out of it. Mm. So I don't know anybody who, you know, and that's one of the things where, look, if you're asking the question and thinking that, that might be a really good thing, it's important to me, I want to have it in a contract, you really need to go meet with a lawyer who can help give you some advice. Because I, I would, if that person came into me, I would just say, look, <laughs> do you want, do you want a good marriage? Do you want one where you're going to have a great sex life? Or, you know, do you want one where you've got this, like, indentured servant who is only doing things out of, you know, a contractual right. obligation? Right. In my mind, that would really stink. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I think some of this stuff, but, you know, at different strokes for different folks. Now, you know, I was, by the way, we're uh, chatting with Jennifer Hargrave, family law attorney, and uh, she knows the ins and outs of getting in and out of a marriage. I, 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 this, is, this actually is a very serious point here. I mean, there are um, you know, custody fights over, over children. Well, you don't know mm -hmm. going into a marriage how many children you're going to be blessed with or if you're going to have any children at all. So it's very difficult to say, okay, if this marriage breaks up, I get the kids. I suppose mm -hmm. you could write something like that in if both parties agree. But a lot of people come into a marriage with pets, right? They come in with pets. They might have a dog, a cat, a goldfish, whatever. And so they're using a prenup to make sure that if something happens, hey, this was my dog when I came into this marriage. It's my dog if I have to leave this marriage. Those things are becoming very, very popular. Right, we call them the pet nuptial, right? Mm. And um, certainly they come up in divorces, too. Look, I, and I can only speak to you from Texas law. That's where I'm licensed to practice. Mm. But pets have historically been property, like your, you know, your grandmother's hut or your <laughs> collection of baseball cards. I mean, right. pets are property. They're personal property. Um, so it makes sense. I mean, if you, if you want to have a provision about your pets, you can do that. People spend a lot of money fighting over pet issues in divorces and custody cases. So, you know, if you feel really strongly about that, that might not be a bad I think, the idea to put that in a premarital agreement. Um, but I was going to just touch real quick on kid issues. So because it's such an unknown and we don't know um, that, I mean, people will put provisions in in these premarital agreements regarding the kids, that they are not at all binding on the court. So, at least in the state of Texas. So, now, what does this um, mean? They're not binding. In, in other words, if you go into a marriage and you have, yeah. so, like, in a prenup, and it says, "Okay, here's Ralph and Rita," and it and they right. come to 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 get married, but they want a prenup, and Rita says, "You know, if we have kids, I get the kids if this marriage breaks up." That's not binding in a court. Yeah, yeah, and it makes good sense because think about this. What if it turns out that Rita ends up becoming an alcoholic or has well, a severe addiction to... She was when I knew her. Right? She was so. when I knew her, Jennifer. I told you it's going to be trouble if she gets a kiss. <laughs> right. So um, so it's because the courts have to look at what's in the best interest of the children, and those circumstances change over the time, right. and, and, and a court isn't going to be bound by what you thought would happen when you had kids. And it turns out that, you know, Ralph really doesn't like kids at no. all, or Rita doesn't no. like kids. No, they, yeah. they should have never gotten married in the first place. No, um, there's a lot of that, but uh, <laughs> that put me out of business. <laughs> no, you need to write a book is what you need to do. Why don't you read a, like a, a do's and don'ts or have you, th here's the title. Before you get married, have you thought about this by Jennifer Hargrave? I'll, you know what? I'll oh, even, I like I'll get, it. I'll get you on <laughs> at least a half dozen times. Here I got buddies in the business. We'll get, you need to write a book about it. This is good stuff, Jennifer. Hey, that sounds great. Well, I will tell you, if you're interested in learning more, we do have a lot of information on our premarital agreements and postmarital agreements, too. You can do it after you're married um, at our website at hargravefamilylaw.com. So we'd okay. you know, love to have you come check out what we've got on, um, on marital property agreements. Hargravefamilylaw.com. You got it. Hey, Jennifer, yeah. it's always great catching up with you. Good luck. Stay well. Stay healthy. We'll visit down the road. Thanks. Sounds good, Ken. Thank you.